In today's lecture, we will cover reading 20, which is international trade and capital flows. So the general plan for today, we will talk about some basic terminology in the context of international trade. Most of these terms you will have heard, but there might be some that are relatively new to you. What are some patterns in international trade over the last few years? We need to understand the concept of absolute and comparative advantage. I feel that these, so this comparative advantage in particular is a very testable area. So we are going to do some examples on this that you need to understand well. Then need to understand what are the different kinds of trade restrictions. So these include tariffs, quotas, uh, voluntary export restraints, etc. And then are these good, bad, what are the implications of these trade restrictions? Then we'll talk about balance of payments, what exactly it means and how it's used. And finally, just a quick blurb on the major international organizations that deal with, uh, with trade and international finance. So the World Trade Organization, the IMF and the World Bank. So you, at least as educated finance professionals, you need to know what these organizations do. So that's the plan. Let's start with international trade and as always we'll simply follow the curriculum. Okay, basic terminology, most terms here hopefully you know. GDP, as we've discussed in earlier classes, is our gross domestic product. So this is a, ge a geographical measure of the value, final value of goods and services produced by a country. It also is the overall income of a country. GNP, gross national product, this also takes into account the income that, let's say, the nationals of your country have abroad. Okay, so it is a national number rather than purely, so, it, so, so this isn't necessarily bounded by uh, geography. You can also have Pakistanis working abroad, <coughs> businesses abroad, so those incomes will also be counted as uh, in GNP. Imports and exports, I'm sure everybody here knows what those terms mean. Terms of trade, you've probably heard this, but most people probably don't know the exact definition. So when we say terms of trade, we simply mean the price of exports divided by price of imports. And obviously this would be in the same currency. If you have a number greater than one, that means that your overall exports and let's say dollar terms exceed overall imports. Trade surplus and trade deficit. Trade surplus basically means that your exports exceed your imports. Probably the biggest trade surplus in the world today is uh, with China. Trade deficit is the opposite, which is the case in Pakistan where the exports are less than the imports. In the US also there is a trade deficit. Okay. Here is a term you might not have heard, autarky. It's the opposite of free trade. So if a country has a completely closed system, so no trade with other countries, you know, restriction on capital flows, restriction on goods going in and out, what you might call a closed economy, to some extent maybe India in the 1970s. So that would be a uh, autarky. Free trade means so, com uh, so uh, companies or, or countries that follow free trade means that they freely allow goods to move back and forth, freely allow money slash capital to move uh, across uh, uh, geographic boundaries. Trade protection, and we'll see examples of this. So a country might say that we want to protect the automotive industry in, in our country or we want to protect the textile industry. So to protect the textile industry, the government, let's say, puts a ban on importing clothes from abroad. So that would be an example of trade protection. We'll talk about uh, this in more detail. And then in terms of capital, there is a concept of uh, FDI, so foreign direct investment. So if ICI comes and sets up a factory in Pakistan, that would be an example of foreign direct investment and obviously if another company does a foreign direct investment in Pakistan then that company becomes a multinational company. So generally FDI would be a longer term investment versus a foreign portfolio investment where Goldman Sachs feels for some reason that Pakistani equity markets are both undervalued 
and have a low correlation with global markets which terms you will understand better later so they decide to put let's say 2 million dollars in the karachi stock exchange short term so this would be an example of a foreign portfolio investment okay now section 2.2 and 2.3 from a learning objectives perspective what you really need to focus on is the benefits and the costs of trade and then while it's not explicitly a learning objective but there's a whole segment in the curriculum on what are the trends so i'll cover both these segments together i think the benefits and costs are fairly straightforward when you have lots of free trade there is benefit in terms of the importing company gets lower cost goods so for example people in the us benefit by buying chinese products at a lower price so china can make a given product of a given quality at a lower price relative to the us so us consumers benefit tremendously by getting those products at a lower price there is greater employment in the exporting <coughs> countries so the countries that can produce products at a good price there the employment goes up so in a sense the consumers in the importing country benefit and the factors of production the labor etc in the exporting country benefit so who loses out there are some costs the jobs are lost in the importing country okay so if the us outsources or if the us imports let's say cooking ware from china then the people in that industry in the us obviously lose out so they need to be retrained and they need to maybe start doing something that the us is good at okay now so the what generally economists will argue is that trade overall benefits both developed and developing countries and there is a lot of literature in the curriculum that shows that trade has steadily increased over the years and they will also show you graphs that countries that have opened up their trading policies or have more open free trade oriented policies tend to have done well over the years and obviously there are some losers in trade but hopefully the winners compensate the losers such that everybody benefits so at least from a theoretical perspective free trade should benefit everyone in 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 that spirit i think there is a world bank report from 2009 and i feel just reading what they have to say summarizes this this viewpoint when exports are concentrated in labor intensive manufacturing trade increases and wages for unskilled workers uh, benefiting poor people it also encourages macroeconomic stability again benefiting the poor who are more likely to be hurt by inflation and through innovation and factor accumulation it enhances productivity and thus growth there may be some empirical uncertainty about the strength of trade's relationship with growth but essentially all rich and emerging countries have a strong trade orientation so essentially they are simply making a point that trade has been growing emerging countries as well as developing countries are moving towards free trade and that benefits both the rich and the poor countries okay now we are going to apply a little bit of logic first about how is trade making two uh, two imaginary countries better and then we will get into some more quantitative examples so let's consider two countries that produce only two goods and suppose the cost of producing cotton relative to lumber is lower in cotton land so that's country 1 which produces cotton and lumber but obviously it's better at producing cotton what is lumber hmm lumber is wood okay so the other is lumber land so they produce lots of wood okay so cotton land might be pakistan lumber land might be canada so lumber land produces both uh, cotton and wood lumber but is better at producing lumber now how would trade make a uh, trade between the two countries affect the lumber industry in lumberland okay so when you trade a uh, 
what will so just logically what's what's a sensible thing to do cotton land is good at producing cotton but it still produces some lumber though maybe inefficiently so what makes sense is cotton land focuses its energy on producing cotton lumber land focuses its energy on producing lumber and then they trade so everybody's better off okay so so and then how would trade between the two countries affect lumber industry in lumberland what will happen to the industry it will go up there will be more economies of scale for example more people employed they can benefit through both economies of scale and specialization and so on so their productivity might go up how would trade between the two countries affect lumberland industry in cotton land yeah that will go down so what about the poor workers in that industry yeah they they get unemployed but then what would be the sensible thing for them to do so they should be retrained and focus on a industry that their country is good at what would happen to the lumber industry workers in cotton land in the long run so the industry will go down and uh, people will move towards cotton uh, what does it mean when we talk about gains from trade and what are the benefits i think with these examples very often when you read the solutions they summarize that you know, five pages worth of text very well and this is what you need to know from your exam perspective so gains from trade imply that the overall benefit of trade outweigh the losses from trade it does not mean that all stakeholders benefit from trade so there are people who lose out but when we say gains from trade we are saying overall and economists generally like to look at overall picture and hope that people who are doing well somehow give some of their wealth to the poor for those who lose out and the other point is some of the benefits from trade include gains from exchange and specialization based on relative cost advantage and this relative cost advantage we'll talk about soon gains from economies of scale as companies add new markets for their products greater variety of products available to households and firms greater efficiency from increased competition more efficient allocation and so on so these are generally the benefits of <coughs> trade okay now we are going to get into comparative advantage and absolute advantage the more important one is comparative advantage but you need to understand both so this is just a introductory slide that up to this point we have not been precise about what it means for a country to have a comparative advantage all we said vaguely is lumberland is better at making lumber cotton land is better at making cotton and so on so we we will define comparative advantage and distinguish it from what's called absolute advantage and we will demonstrate that the gains from trading in accordance with comparative advantage we then will explain these two models one's a ricardian model and one's a hecksher olin model so all these are learning objectives which i believe are quite testable the basic point is to distinguish between absolute and comparative advantage okay let's say we have two countries that make only two goods brazil which produces pens and pencils but uh, brazil's productivity is such that one worker can either make 20 pens a day or he makes 40 pencils a day chinese workers produce 10 pens a day or they can produce 60 pencils a day so who has the absolute advantage in terms of pencils so who's better so a chinese worker can make 60 pencils a day versus a brazilian who makes only 40 so clearly just in absolute terms china has an advantage over has the absolute advantage over brazil as far as pencils are concerned who has the absolute advantage when it comes to pens brazil yeah because brazil is better at making pens one worker can make 20 pens a day versus uh 10 in china so that's absolute advantage very straightforward okay what about comparative advantage when we talk about comparative advantage we need to look at the cost of one product in terms of the other so let's say we first take the now we are going to talk about comparative advantage and that's the more testable one absolute advantage is pretty straightforward so let's take the case of uh, china so in china 
what's the opportunity cost for a pain so so this means the opportunity cost if you give up one pen how many more pencils will you get so opportunity cost for pen is six pencils all right what about if you take um, brazil in brazil what's the opportunity cost for a pen so so here it is an opportunity cost for a pen is two pencils so in uh, if a brazilian worker does not make a pen he can then make two pencils so in which country so which country has a lower opportunity cost for pens yeah so brazil has a lower opportunity cost for pens so that means brazil has a comparative advantage relative to compared to whom china. compared to china in making uh, making pens so brazil has a comparative advantage with so i can say brazil has a comparative advantage for pens now what about uh, for pencils so again with uh, brazil what's the opportunity cost for pencils so with brazil the opportunity cost for <coughs> pencil so if he doesn't make a pencil he can make half a pen okay so for every pencil the opportunity cost is uh, so so this is now for a pencil is half a pen what about for china the opportunity cost for a pencil is is 1 over 6 pen so who is better at making pencils so who has the comparative advantage yeah so china now the cost is 1 6 pen so china has the comparative advantage <coughs> now <coughs> what does this imply for trade the logical thing to do would be that china focuses on making pencils because it has a comparative advantage in pencils whereas brazil should focus on making pens because it has a comparative advantage with pens and then they should trade so both brazilians and chinese can then be better off because through trade they can increase the overall number of pens and pencils they have okay so that's the idea did that register okay if you found this clip interesting and informative please visit my website www.arifirfanullah.com here you will find a tremendous amount of useful material right here in the 2011 CFA video lecture series you will find the entire level 1 curriculum for free and most of the material here is still relevant so this is worth looking at The 2012 video lecture series covers both level one and level two. These lectures are available for a fee. And uh, finally, down here, uh, financial management at IBA. Here you will find my lectures at IBA uh, for a course on financial management. Plus, you will find lots of useful spreadsheets that can help you with financial modeling. So again, please visit. www.arifirfanullah.com thank you